No. Okay. So let's, press on uh, live let's just get it get it going. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Here at Cabinet HR, we're getting ready to release a bit of of our, of our HR platform, and we're looking for people to sign up for our waitlist. If you have a company with 49 or fewer people, you can sign up for our waitlist at www.cabinetshr.co. Our guest today is Jimmy Song. Jimmy, are you ready to be great today? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on your show. Jimmy is a Bitcoin developer, educator, entrepreneur. He's an open source contributor to many different Bitcoin projects and is, author, is, and is the author of Programming Bitcoin from O'Reilly, the little Bitcoin book, and thank God for Bitcoin. Jimmy writes a weekly newsletter, Bitcoin Tech Talks, and has a podcast, Bitcoin Fixes This. Jimmy, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad to uh, you know, converse with you and be on your show. So Jimmy, before we get uh, started with the Bitcoin and developer stuff, let's talk about Korea first. Um, <laughs> so you're from Korea, and me, and I was in the Army, my family who actually lived in Seoul, Korea from 05 to 08. Um, oh, wow. So if I, if I remember from another podcast, so you left there when you were seven years old? Yeah, I, I was eight years old, uh, 1985. Uh, so you can figure out how old I am. <laughs> yeah, that 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 was uh, quite a long time ago, and that's uh, probably not the Korea that you saw when you were there in 05. Because yeah, it, like it was a very different place when I left. Have you been back since then? Yeah, so I, I uh, went back briefly in 88 for like a month in the summer, 94 uh, for a few months, and then. Um, like for something like 23 years, I didn't go back. Um, I, I went there a couple of years ago and then I went, uh, well, three years ago and then I went back two years ago. Um, and you know, it's, uh, definitely a very different place. Um, you know, everything is like hyper connected and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, uh, internet cafes and stuff <laughs> like that and the culture there. Um, yeah, so it, it was a little bit of a shock to me and, uh, I, I think, um, it's a normal part of sort of like the immigrant experience is that you have a, um, a vision of what you left. And then when you come back and like, like you don't uh, account for the delta between what, what you left and what, uh, you know, what changes have been. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a very different place. And uh, I, I know my parents have felt the same way. And whenever they go back to Korea, it's like, wow, this place is just uh, completely different. Um, and, you know, uh, like in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of between two cultures in that way. Like I, I was born born there, but I consider myself an American and I can barely speak the language when I go there and everyone, uh, you know, like if I try to speak Korean, they'll try to speak to me in English, that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's kind of a weird, uh, weird thing to be Korean uh, American and go back to Korea. Yeah, me and my family were from 05 to 08 when I was in the Army. And, like, people in the United States have no idea how, like, how advanced Korea is, right, as far as tech, right? I remember getting there, like, the yeah. first day and seeing, like, TVs on top of buildings, like, doing a key, a, like, a, what we call it, a, 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 um, a number thing to open the door to your apartment in your house, right? And, mm -hmm. like, just, they're so far advanced. But at the same time, you'd be, like, on a road with a bunch of cars and stuff and have, like, a horse-drawn cart in the middle of the road, right? And they'll just stop and set up shop and start, start, start selling stuff in the middle of the highway, so it's, it's like, you know, it's like, it, it's definitely a balance, right? But yeah, but Korea is a great place. We had a great time there. I mean, just a, you know, it's a major city, like Seoul's one of the biggest cities in the world. It has everything you want, want there. We had a great time there. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's uh, certainly a nice place to visit. And, uh, and I'm not sure it's a great place to live just because of how competitive everything is, especially for kids. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are Korean American that moved back there for at least a little bit and then had kids and they're like, okay, I, I got to move back because it's just way too competitive. And, uh, you know, the quality of life in that aspect can be very difficult. Um, but, you know, like for uh, just sort of like visiting and hanging out and things like that, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice place and, you know, definitely recommend it if you're a world traveler. And do you see a family there or all your families in the States now? Um, I mean, I, I have some extended family that are still there and I, I saw them the last time I was there and it, it was weird, right? Because, uh, you know, something I haven't seen in like 20, 30 years. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, the, you, know uh, you are family and, you know, that, that's the one thing about family is uh, you get to, um, you know, connect in a way that you really, 
you know, it, that that's different than with friends or colleagues or acquaintances and things like that. So uh, it was good to see them. I, I tried to encourage them to, um, you know, figure out a way to go find opportunity elsewhere in the world because uh, <laughs> Korea is Korea's kind of tough. So, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, it, we, we, we'll see what happens in the future. Who knows, maybe there, there'll be reunification in the next 10 years and then the economy will open up and there'll be more trade with China and things like that. But um, for, for now, it's it's kind of this uh, weird um, place where, you know, uh, it's like hyper competitive and the birth rates are super low. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of in a weird state. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have like that great a uh, hopeful prospect <laughs> given just how few pe babies they're having and things like that. Yeah, one thing that was kind of weird, like when being a soul, like you're in this big city, you know, popular technology advance, mm -hmm. you know, I and mean, then it's like 50 miles away, North Korea could like rain down all this, you know, artillery <laughs> on us, you know. So it's always like, you know, you don't think about it, but it's always like in the back of your mind, like, okay, you know. Yeah. So that's something you have to get used to. And yeah, it's like, and it's, yeah, go ahead. And, and then, um, and so no, you go ahead. Well, I, I mean, it's it, it, that, that, uh, that's always there that that North Korea thing and it, you're sort of like hyper vigilant almost um, and that uh, it, it is on the back of your mind and it is it does sort of like cause a lot of people to I don't know like have a slightly higher time preference I think um, but yeah it, it's it's just a weird place in that way because we're not used to that at least here in the states and then you ate your family moved to Texas uh, no, no, we uh, we moved to New Jersey. My dad was uh, working in uh, in New York, and you know, um, I, I lived there right up until college. Uh, went to college in Michigan, then went to Boston for a good long time because I was uh, working at different startups as a programmer. And I only moved to Texas about nine years ago. And Texas, um, I think, is a uh, uh, pretty good I, i'm aligned pretty well with the values of texas so i really enjoy it and so um I remember correctly in my research when you started coding like at eight or nine years old like pretty pretty young right yeah i I've, I've always been sort of like um into computers and like i i still remember as like a nine-year-old i I saw people playing with them and I was like, I have no idea what this does, but I, I want to learn about it. And uh, my, my parents indulged me. Uh, they got me different computers. Um, I, I think my first one was a Commodore 16 that we got from Toys R Us, uh, then uh, an 8086 uh, from Hyundai, like uh, in middle school and a 486 in high school. So, um, you know, all through that time, uh, because there weren't uh, you know, like I wanted to learn how to do stuff with them. I, I picked up some programming. Uh, my parents found me some people that could teach me. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's part of me, like part of being American for me, like, and I didn't code at all in Korea, but like the, the, this, this is, uh, very much a part of who I am at this point. And code is just like learning another language, right? Uh, in a way, it's um, it's there. There's an internal logic to it that you you have to really understand, um, and you know you can make it do a, a whole bunch of things as long as you can clearly define it. Um, and thinking in that rigorous way, I think, is something that I was um, sort of attuned to. Just that's just how my mind works. I, I was a math major in college, for example. I, I like to know things from first principles and uh, and be able to prove things. Um, and that, that's what computer science is really uh, all about. And this is one of the reasons I got into coding and eventually Bitcoin. So do you have to be mathematically or logically inclined to be a successful developer? Uh, it depends. I mean, there, there's, uh, I mean, being a programmer now is a much wider uh, spectrum of things than it used to be. It used to be, you know, to be a programmer was um, doing COBOL maintenance on a bank uh, you know, mainframe or something like that. Um, it, now, you know, you got front end, back end, um, you know, DevOps and all sorts of, uh, you know, I mean, like got smart contract programmers in, in, in some of these things. And there, there's a whole variety and some of them require a little more rigor than others uh, um, in terms of technical ability. Others require more of a design sense um, and still others require more, um, you know, 
managerial experience and um, you know putting processes together and stuff. Um, I mean, program there there are just so many paths now because software has, uh, um, as Mark and Jason says, um, you know, eaten the world. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, there, 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 uh, there's a lot of different ways in which you can be a co coder. Um, that said, I, I've, I've done almost all of those things, like tweak JavaScript to make a website look a certain way, to tweak, uh, you know, database queries to make them run faster, and you know, uh, you know, write scripts to provision AWS, wh whatever, right? Like it, it, it's, there's, there's a significant uh, variety within programming that you can get into. So Jamie, for new developers out there, would you recommend that they'd be like kind of like generous and learn a little bit of, a little bit of everything, or that she found like find a niche? Um, I mean, if you want to get into it and get paid, I would I would recommend just getting into a coding boot camp. I mean, the these are highly optimized for um, getting hired by a company and making sure that you get a decent salary and so on. And a lot of them, if uh, you know, if, if you show some aptitude, um, have scholarships and so on. So, um, and the industry is always looking for new coders. So um, that that would probably be the path I would take instead of getting a four year degree. You do a six week boot, or six to eight week boot camp and then have a job afterwards. Now that's not an easy six to eight weeks. It it really is like a an army boot camp or something like that, where it's extremely intense and they they whip you into shape and half the people don't end up graduating because you know it was so tough or whatever. Um, but that that's that's part of the deal is um, is uh, you know they're they're weeding out like the people that can't cut it. But um, I would say that 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 would be the way I would go. And a lot of people have successfully gotten into the industry that way. And then one, once you have your foot in the door, then explore what might be interesting to you. Because, uh, you know, if you're if you're not a programmer, you don't know what you don't know. And uh, until you get into the industry and work a little bit, you're not going to really understand um, all the uh, nuances of what's required of a particular job and so on. So I, I would encourage that um, uh, if you want to learn on your own and not go through a boot camp and pay them. I don't know. I think they charge like twenty thousand dollars at this point. Um, then go, uh, learn on your own, uh, it's probably going to take you a lot longer and contribute to open source projects and just slowly ramp up that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, there, you know, it, it is about money at the end of the day. So, uh, you know, like, I, I think that's probably the best, uh, or fastest way to, uh, get into the industry. So Jimmy, when you look to hire developers or to work with other developers, what characteristics or values are you looking for in the other developers that have? Yeah, I mean, the main thing is that they know what they're doing. <laughs> like this, and that's the, that's not entirely obvious. And yet you have to, like, uh, you know, a lot of interviews require some sort of coding um, problem and make sure that they can solve it. And if they can't, then they're not going to be able to do the job that you have them for. Um, so that that's one part of it. The other part is just... Um, you know, making sure that they show up on time and, you know, uh, get the work done and, um, you know, some uh, capacity for self-learning is, uh, uh, is usually a very good signal. Um, uh, and, you know, a lot, a lot of programmers tend to be lazy, so they don't, <laughs> they don't want to learn. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th those are the things I look for. Um, but you know, it's been a while since I've had to go and hire people. I've been working for myself for a while. So, yeah. So Jim, you always hear the term good code and bad code. What does that even mean and who defines that? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's more art than science. And uh, you, you can, you kind of know it when you see it. Uh, but, you know, um, at least for me, having clean code, uh, code that's easy to read, easy to change, easy to document and easy to, um, you know, test and things like that. Th those are, those are important considerations. And that's how I would uh, judge it. Um, I, I've been in code bases that are complete mess that have none of those things. And, um, you know, I've had to like trace things back and, uh, you know, learn it like uh, point by point. Um, and it took me like a month to do that as a pretty good developer, I think, uh, like looking at a legacy code base. Um, and that, that, that's not a good situation that you want to put anyone in because uh, you're not going to be able to move fast enough. Um, you know, that said, you know, they're, they're still COBOL programmers that, uh, you know, fix bugs in a mainframe or whatever, uh, you know, it, from software built from the 70s. So, I mean, not everyone needs to have, uh, you know, super clean code uh, or whatever. 
but it is a lot easier to work with when you have that. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's not really defined by anyone per se, um, but it's more defined by uh, the ability to do all of those things, like being able to test it, being able to change it, being able to read it and, and so on. And it's other people that sort of de it determines that as, as we say in coding, uh, it's usually just written once, but read like hundreds of times. So if you don't uh, optimize for readability, it's, uh, and, you know, it's basically not clean and kind of dirty code. So Jamie, from your experience, is it better or do you prefer when like a group of developers are in one room working together, like one big white room, whatever the case, or is it better that everyone's remotely remote or does it matter? Or is it case by case? Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's case by case. And um, the, the more important thing is that you review each other's code to make sure that it's readable. Um, and that this is something that a lot of programmers miss is they, they'll just write in and assume somebody else will figure out whatever they wrote. Um, but being able to, um, make sure that uh, your code is readable to others, uh, uh, like makes it easier for other developers. Um, and that, that's a more important consideration than whether, whether you're sitting in the same room or not, uh, is making sure that other people can read it. And that's, uh, you know, that, that can be, uh, you know, trickier than you think, uh, especially because in most languages, there's more than one way to do something. And um, you know, clarifying it. Um, and, you know, even if it's a little slower, making sure that it's readable and things like that. Uh, I mean, I, I've had programmers work for me that were too clever by half and they, <laughs> they'll put one, uh, one liners in that, that do the work of like five or 10 lines. But like when you try to go read it, it's like, okay, I don't, I don't understand what this is. Um, that that's that's bad what what you want to do is make it clear what you're doing and even if it takes more lines um you know do it in a way that other people can read um so yeah i i, I would say that that's how you would figure it out so jim it's like in the world of software development things always getting changed updated things you know all you know getting approved it can be easy for people to keep them updated up to, and up to date on their skills is there an easy way to do this or just a matter of like, you know, grinding it out and like doing it all the time? Uh, updating your skills. I mean, th this is where continuing education comes in. I mentioned earlier that uh, a capacity for self-learning is, um, is, is something that I look for in a very good signal in a developer. Um, and th this is something that developers have to do all the time. Um, you know, like when I started uh, back in 98, there wasn't anything called Docker uh, or, you know, VMs even. Uh, so, um, being able to uh, you know learn new things uh, fairly quickly, oftentimes is a is a big part of being a developer. Uh, you're you're always going to have new frameworks, new tools, new things that you can use, um, and if you can't do that, um, then you know you get kind of stuck in one uh, one thing. Uh, I mean, which might be okay. Like you're you're still going to make money as a developer, um, being sort of that Java guy or uh, you know, Oracle DB uh, admin or something like that. Uh, but like to really like, at, at least for me, that's not that fun uh, to do the same thing over and over again. And oftentimes you're one of the first people to cut because uh, you, you don't have any versatility. Um, so learning new things uh, is a core part of being a developer. And I, I, I don't know, I try to pick up a language every few years. Um, uh, a new language so I can, you know, try different things and see what the advantages of those things are and so on. Um, and learning new things is, is, is a good thing. So Jamie, if you're a good developer, are you basically a good developer? What I mean is like, if you're, if you're good at Python, Python, go to Java, you go to Java, you go to TypeScript, go to TypeScript, you can be a good gaming developer, go to gaming developer, you'd be a good Bitcoin developer or all of them like completely different. Uh, they can be different. It really depends. Uh, obviously, uh, certain skills are going to carry over to others uh, a little easier and better. Um, so, I mean, you know, programming at a, a hedge fund for a high frequency trading um, application is going to be very different than, you know, uh, programming for a web 2.0 startup and making a single page, uh, you know, dynamic, uh, you know, uh, you know, website or something like that. Um, you know, they're, they're all very different. Um, there is some crossover in logic and things like that. But as I said before, 
um, different developers have different um, you know skills that they need. So uh, you you might need a little bit of an eye for design if you're doing front end work. Uh, if you're doing like more ba hardcore back end work, you might need to have more of a grasp of different algorithms, um, things of that nature. Um, you know, uh, but you know, a lot of it does cross over. Um, and you know, you know, I, I I know where my weaknesses as a developer are, and I think uh, you know anyone that's been a developer for a while um, does as well. But it, it really comes down to um, the specifics of what uh, what you're required to do, um, and you know, I, I wouldn't say that uh, you know it's uh, you know a good developer is just a good developer, um, but there is uh, some degree of crossover that um, that's appreciated by every one of those uh, fields. Timmy, can you talk about how you got involved with startups? Uh, well, I, I got involved back in 98 because my high school friend had graduated from Harvard and he needed uh, uh, people for a startup. So he called me um, and asked me to join his startup. So I did. And um, since then, I've, I've done a lot of other startups. Uh, and the, this is sort of like the, the route that I've taken. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, um, it's almost always, uh, for early stage startups, it's based on who, you know, um, who you happen to know. Um, and, uh, you know, like there, there are job openings that you can apply for and so on, but, uh, you know, almost all the jobs that I got, uh, as a startup veteran, uh, was through other people that I knew, um, and, well, I, I had a few in there where it was like, uh, you know, I used a recruiter or something like that. But uh, most of them, I think, uh, came more through personal connection. So, you know, cultivating that is a big part of being a developer as well. So what do you do startups just like the beginning, the starting the business from the start or what's, what draws you to it? Uh, I mean, I, I enjoy startups because you uh, don't have like a lot of... Um, you can do a lot of different things and you don't have as much structure. Um, you know, I, I've worked in corporate environments before and they kind of put you in a box and, um, you know, tell you to work on a particular thing, which can kind of get, gets boring for me. <laughs> uh, I, I want to work on a lot of different things. And if something isn't catching my fancy, I want the option to go work on something else. Um, so, yeah, I, I think for me, uh, you know, the energy around the startup is more interesting than sort of like a normal corporate job, uh, which tends to be, you know, very nine to five and you know, do this, this, this and this. And I don't know, I, I've never sort of been that kind of person. And so you, have you ever worked for a corporate? It's all been startups. Uh, mostly startups. I, I've worked for a couple of corporate entities. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just didn't enjoy it, uh, especially the bureaucracy and things of that nature. Now, speaking of corporate, you, I think you currently, uh, you currently teach at UT Austin, correct? Yeah, well, I, before the pandemic, yes, I did. Uh, okay. I, like the, the pandemic put a little bit of a halt to some of that stuff. Oh, did it? Okay. So how was that experience? You, you, I believe you caught, you, caught, you caught a big Bitcoin class? Yeah, I did. It was uh, it was for graduate students in uh, computer science and uh, and the business school, um, and it was a pretty popular class. It was uh, I think I had like sixty people, including all the faculty and visiting faculty that wanted <laughs> to take the class for some reason. Um, but yeah, it, it it was a fun experience. But you know, like one of the things I I realized almost right away is that universities have a pretty big bureaucracy. I, I remember having to yes, like they do going through like. Uh, you know, all these like uh, sexual harassment training videos and things of that nature, which I like, what? okay, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, it was a, it was a good experience uh, in the sense that I got to, um, uh, you know, see, see where people were at, um, you know, for the most part, these were professional students, right? Because <laughs> like, they, they've been in school for something like 20 years uh, being in graduate school. Um yeah, it, it was uh, it was good. Um, I I, I uh, enjoy sort of like the more intense two day seminars that I give, um, and those those uh, tend to produce uh, more people that are contributing to the Bitcoin network and so on. Um, whereas you know, like in a university setting, um, tends to be a little bit more academic focus. You know, the the kids are a little bit more concerned about the grade that they're get, gonna get than 
um, say somebody that's coming to my seminar that's already paid me a bunch of money and, and they're there to learn, right? Like, um, and th those two sound similar, but they're actually quite different um, and they change the incentives uh, somewhat. So, yeah. So Jimmy, um, you wrote a book called The Little Bitcoin Book. And I think you wrote it with five other people. Can you talk about that book? It was seven other people. Seven other uh, people. But that, that book was um, originally intended uh, as a way to give people that don't know anything about Bitcoin uh, a way in uh, to kind of understand it. Uh, I wrote it with seven other people in what's called a book sprint. And we wrote the book in a week uh, in an Airbnb that we found. And we just stayed there and wrote all day uh, for seven days. Well, no, like five days, actually. Um, and by the end of it, we were able to upload it to Amazon as an ebook. Uh, it took a little longer to do the physical book and so on. But that, that, that's what we did. Uh, and it's, it's meant to be like a really uh, fast way to get caught up on what Bitcoin is and, what, and why it matters. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that was a pretty fun experience, uh, you know, writing a book with a bunch of other people. Um, I've done this in startups and uh, in other contexts. Uh, so like uh, there's something called a coding sprint where you might, um, you know, try to uh, code uh, a particular feature or something like that uh, with a group of people in a very short amount of time. There's something called the product sprint where you try to create a whole new product uh, as quickly as possible with, uh, with minimum friction, um, in, you know, in something like a week, um, and doing the same for a book was a really fun experience. So looking book, looking back to the book, did the book meet the objectives you wanted the book to do for y'all? Uh, the, the objective, uh, like, so we, one, one of the things that you do in sort of like a product sprint is, okay, what do you, what do you want the user to be able to do? What do you want them to say about the product and stuff like that? So, uh, you know, with, with the book sprint, I made all of the authors write an Amazon review that they wanted to see first. Uh, that way we could sort of like begin with the end in mind. Um, and, you know, we basically wanted people to say, hey, like I, uh, I didn't know anything about Bitcoin and uh, I was surprised to find that it isn't just for drug users or, <laughs> uh, you know, like tax dodgers and uh, speculative traders that it, it does actually help humanity and that there are all these people in the third world that are using it as a lifeline and so on. Um, and, you know, uh, that that has been largely the feedback that we've, we've received. So, yeah, it's been good. What do you think about the other thing is El Salvador is going to do Bitcoin as a currency now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that's the result of something that's already been happening within El Salvador. There's a place called Bitcoin Beach, which is apparently a surfing paradise. Uh, but there, there's a bunch of people there that are using the Bitcoin Lightning Network to transact everything uh, as it's a lot easier and doesn't require um, the heavy hand of regulatory, um, uh, you know, burden that like uh, using credit cards and, and, and other banking services require. Um, and uh, as a result of that, the president of El Salvador, uh, Nicolas Bukele, uh, decided that, you know, he wanted more of that in his country and, uh, you know, passed the law that basically made Bitcoin a currency in that country. And, um, you know, there's a lot more investment coming into El Salvador as a result. Um, and I expect that place to thrive as a result. Uh, and yeah, it, it's thri thrived already in, in a sense in, on B Bitcoin Beach. Uh, the president there is trying to bring it to the rest of the country because of what he's seeing there. And Jimmy, when people pay you, you prefer payment of Bitcoin, right? Yes, I do. Um, it's a lot easier. You don't have to go through the banking system and you get it right away. So of course, yeah. <laughs> and you also do a podcast called Bitcoin Fixes This. How long have you been doing the podcast? And Yeah, I, I've been doing the podcast for a little over a year now. And I, I really only started because I wanted uh, more adult conversation. Um, I, I can talk to my kids and whatever, but, uh, you know, like being trapped at home and everything else, I, I wanted... Um, you know, other people to speak with. And that's, that's, that's what I did. And uh, yeah, it's grown. And a lot of I've had some, I have had the privilege of having some pretty interesting guests. So yeah, for me, it's a, it's a way to talk about topics I like and then bring Bitcoin into it whenever it's appropriate. Um, but it doesn't always. And I've, uh, I've had some fun conversations with like MLB all-stars, UFC, former UFC fighters, <laughs> Uh, you know, farmers and, you know, uh, yeah, activists of various stripes and, and things like that. So it's been, it's been really fun. Cool. Um, 
So what's a simple definition of Bitcoin? Digital gold. That's it. Uh, it's uh, it's like gold in that it's decentralized. No one, um, ha, you know, sort of produces it. Um, or you don't need anyone's permission to produce it and so on. But it's, uh, you know, um, anyone can mine it. And it's decentralized in the sense, uh, it, well, it's digital in the sense that you can, doesn't require the moving of something physical like gold does. Um, so it's digital gold. It's, it's like gold 2.0, it's way better um, in uh, being able to be transported across space. It also has a better scarcity than gold. Uh, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. Um, yet Bitcoin is divisible down to eight decimals places. So it's far more divisible than gold is. Um, one Satoshi, which is the smallest unit of Bitcoin, uh, is something like a 30th of a penny. So uh, that means that uh, Bitcoin is more divisible, way more divisible than even the US dollar. Uh, and it's uh, like portable, uh, very, very quickly portable, like uh, most of the US dollar system is uh, in, in its digitization. Uh, so, you know, with that scarcity, with that decentralization and that digitization, it's, um, it's more or less an ideal money uh, because you're not subject to theft from either the government or, uh, you know, uh, third parties that you have to trust as with almost every other thing out there. So who decided this limit on Bitcoin and how was it decided upon? Like why that it was numbers? Satoshi Nakamoto who uh, invented Bitcoin uh, back in 2008, um, and that uh, that 21 million cannot be changed. So that that's the big part of it is that it gives you certainty over the long term, which uh, you can't really get with almost anything else. Uh, gold has been the closest thing, largely because historically gold has had about a two percent inflation rate. So any given year. Uh, no matter how hard they tried, uh, you would only be able to increase the amount of gold by 2%. Uh, with almost any other commodity, this isn't the case. So for example, aluminum, um, you know, right now you get 100% inflation in, uh, in, in aluminum. Uh, there's always new aluminum coming onto the market because it's fairly easy to mine for it and it, it, it isn't as rare as something like gold. Uh, whereas with gold, you know, like for 5,000 years or something to that effect, uh, the inflation rate of gold has been about 2%. Um, very remarkable, uh, but there's no guarantee that it'll stay that way. Uh, NASA, for example, found uh, an asteroid in 2019 that had more gold in it than all above ground gold on earth. Um, if say they were to figure out a way to go mine for that gold on that asteroid and do it in an efficient way, uh, efficient cost-effective way, the amount of gold would increase significantly and it would probably uh, decrease in value significantly because of the expansion of supply. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't suffer from that problem because of this absolute scarcity. Um, and that, that's why, you know, I, I advocate for it. So in the US, it's not like we're printing money like it's monopoly money recently. Mm -hmm. There's no threat of that with Bitcoin then, right? Yeah, there's no threat of that. And, uh, but it is a threat to every fiat currency and every altcoin because they're centrally controlled. Um, but with Bitcoin, because it's decentralized, that there's no single point of failure, that there's no choke point, if you will. Um, it means that uh, it's not subject to the whims of a central authority or changes by uh, a, a central committee or something like that. It's uh, controlled by the community and um, that means that the 21 million limit will stay. And there's no such thing as a physical Bitcoin, right? I mean, you could you could put a private key on a coin. Uh, and the, that's kind of the picture behind me a little bit. Um, like, or at least uh, they used to use uh, casacious coins for stock photos of Bitcoin. Uh, but uh, it, it comes down to a number. Um, and this is how cryptography works. It's just a really, really large number is your private key. Um, and hiding that from other people is, uh, is the key to storing your wealth. So instead of like a gold bar, which requires physical security, it's, uh, it's security of a number, which can be written down on a piece of paper and enclosed with a temper evidence seal on a, on a coin, in which case it can, I guess, technically be physical. Uh, but for the most part, people keep it on like a hardware wallet or some, uh, somewhere else where um, you can back it up and uh, do things of that nature to secure your own Bitcoin.
So Bitcoin just centralized. Mm -hmm. So who's keeping track of the number of Bitcoin though? Like how do we know when we get to 21 million Bitcoin? Yeah. So everyone uh, uh, runs their own soft, uh, run, runs the software to check uh, uh, on the uh, number of Bitcoin and so on. So um, the uh, Bitcoin runs on uh, something called the blockchain and the blockchain is, all it is, is every single transaction that's ever happened on Bitcoin. And this is transactions starting in 2009. Um, and it's about 400 gigabytes of data, but it, it contains every single transaction that's ever happened on Bitcoin. And you take all of those transactions uh, and make sure that they follow the rules, um, that it doesn't go over 21 million and so on. And you can do this with the software that you're running. Um, and that checks uh, not just uh, all of the stuff that's happened in the past, but all of the new pages to the ledger that are coming into the network every 10 minutes. Um, so you make sure that it, it's legit, valid, and that it's not uh, trying to create new Bitcoins or something like that. And that's something that you can do by running your own software, what we would call in Bitcoin call full node software. And, uh, and there's many thousands of people that are doing that every single day. Uh, you know, that, that are running at 24 seven. Certainly if you're a business that's on Bitcoin, you're doing that yourself. So you don't have to trust anybody. Um, this is in stark contrast to something like the Fed or your bank, where you're not going to be able to audit their balance sheet or their uh, transactions or anything like that. Uh, instead, you just sort of have to blindly trust them and make, uh, to, uh, you know, keep their books balanced and not be bankrupt or something to that effect. Um, and that's the power of decentralization is that uh, really it's not a single entity that's enforcing it. It's the entire community that's enforcing it. Um, and it's uh, it's very literal enforcement. Your, your uh, software is making sure that everything is on the up and up and uh, not fraudulent. And um, it, it, it causes sort of like a radical transparency to everything rather than, you know, things done, uh, you know, in the shadows and behind closed doors and so on. So it's not like Bitcoin is based on a system of, of trusting people to do the right thing. But if you both know, a lot of people don't do the right thing. How, how does that no, no, no. System... It's, 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 it's based on people verifying that everyone else is doing the right thing. Okay. So as soon as you do the wrong thing, the network will know and they will reject your transaction. That's it. Um, and that, uh, you know, anytime someone tries to do something, uh, nefarious, every full node in the world will know within, uh, you know, a few seconds that, Hey, this, this is wrong. And they'll reject it and say, okay, well, we're not accepting this to the ledger, in which case the community, uh, has final say over, uh, what's going on rather than a few central controllers. Now is Bitcoin and cryptocurrency the same thing or is cryptocurrency a part of Bitcoin? Well, so cryptocurrency refers to uh, not just Bitcoin, but every uh, other altcoin. There's something like 10,000 different altcoins right now. Um, and the big difference is uh, Bitcoin is decentralized. Altcoins are centralized. That's a big difference. Um, okay. And altcoins are centralized because they have a creator that's still around, that's uh, calling the shots, that's doing stuff. Um, so the second biggest cryptocurrency right now is Ethereum. And that one is basically run by Vitalik and the Ethereum Foundation. They decide... Um, you know, what the ledger is going to be, how uh, the monetary policy and everything else. Um, there's a hard fork in, uh, in Ethereum called London or something like that, where they're going to essentially change the monetary policy and tax the miners. Um, and that, if, if that sounds familiar, that's because that's pretty much what our government does with our money and so on. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I put out a tweet to, uh, just now about how Ethereum is a is the world's first uh, CBDC, it kind of is. It's a, it's, it's a central bank and it's digital and it's a currency and that, that's, that's what they're attempting to make it uh, by uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, trying different policies and so on. Um, uh, it's just not a government controlled uh, central bank. It's, it's, uh, it's by Vitalik and his friend. So Jamie, I'm sure you have to have certain skills to start, start a cryptocurrency, but can basically anyone start a cryptocurrency? Yeah, you can. I mean, there, there was a website where you could you could pay some small amount of Bitcoin to uh, uh, create a cryptocurrency for you. Um, I mean, it's it's I I, I it, it's not a good thing to be doing. Um, you're essentially making your own money, uh, and the people that are creating these altcoins are basically printing their own money, and that uh, that that's the whole purpose of creating these altcoins. Uh, oftentimes they uh, reward a bunch of it to themselves, like Ethereum did, like Ripple did, like uh, almost every 
coin in the top 20 has done that, uh, where they printed a whole bunch of uh, money for themselves and then marketed the heck out of it to people and then made it worth money. And now they're, uh, next thing you know, they're millionaires. It, and that too should sound familiar because this is exactly how fiat money works. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you, you give uh, uh, newly printed money to the politically favored and, you know, they, they, they have access that the poor people don't and they get to be rich and the poor people get to pay 27% in interest rates on their credit card or whatever. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a horribly unfair system. I don't think you should be making your own cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is the one decentralized cryptocurrency. Uh, and, and for that reason, it's very different than uh, the altcoin. So, um, you know, that, that, that's where I would recommend people put their money instead of uh, playing with uh, speculative gambling vehicles that these altcoins are. So, Jamie, I think the criticism of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general is like the, it's like a drain of resources, I think. Is that a valid criticism? I don't think so. Um, and the people that say that have no idea how the energy market works. Uh, so uh, the Bitcoin mining does require a lot of energy, but you have to re realize that the energy market uh, wastes a lot of energy, period. So something like 30% of all energy produced gets wasted. And the reason for that is because energy has to be optimized for availability. And by that, I mean, like, uh, if you turn your lights on and only turns on like 70% of the time, that would be a disaster, especially in hospitals where you have like life support equipment or something like that. Um, you need continuous power. Um, so what the power companies do is they always, uh, you know, design the grid and design their energy sources to, uh, uh, you know, meet peak demand or a little above peak, peak demand. So, um, in the Northeast, this might be like, uh, you know, during the winter when everyone is using the electricity to heat their homes or something like that. And uh, down south where I am, it might be uh, during the summer when everyone's using their central air conditioning and so on. But whatever it is, you always uh, try to meet peak demand um, all the time. But not all, uh, uh, but peak demand isn't there all of the time. So, uh, you know, uh, during the winter here in Texas, um, you know, typically you use a little less uh, energy than you would during the summer, um, but you still produce the peak amount uh, be just in case. And uh, when you don't have that, uh, you get kind of like disasters that we had in Texas here back in February, where there wasn't enough energy to meet the demand that everyone had, and you have to have like blackouts and so on. Um, so a lot of energy just kind of gets wasted because you produce for peak demand, but not everyone uses it. So about 30% gets wasted all the time everywhere in the world. Uh, what Bitcoin does is it has a very interesting energy profile in that it can take energy whenever it wants, but it doesn't have to run all the time. It, it's not life support equipment or anything to, of that nature. So it's taking uh, this 30% that's being wasted and putting it to good use, which makes a lot of these... Uh, you know, energy uh, providers like more profitable because they're taking energy that would otherwise be wasted or sold for zero or sold for even a negative amount sometimes. Um, and instead they're making a profit on it, um, which, which is great for them and uh, great for any sort of uh, renewable sources of, of energy that, um, that, want, uh, that want to make more money off the energy that they're producing. So. Um, it doesn't waste resources. It's, it's repurposing wasted energy, and that, that's how it works. It's just that not a lot of people understand the subtleties of energy. They think all energy is sort of equivalent or something to that effect. So, Jimmy, is the correct term develop Bitcoin or mine Bitcoin? Well, so there are different things. So developing Bitcoin is working on the open source project as a programmer. Mining Bitcoin is the process of bringing new Bitcoin into existence and adding new pages to the ledger. Um, so mining Bitcoin is, uh, is a lot like uh, mining gold. Uh, so I'm told that in order to mine one ounce of gold, you have to process something like 42 tons of dirt and rock. Uh, so it, it's very, very hard to find, but once you find that ounce of gold, it's very easy to verify their chemical tests and so on. And it's certainly less costly. Um, Bitcoin mining is the same way, uh, except instead of dirt and rock, you have to process lots and lots of numbers. So um, you once you find sort of that nugget uh, or the one number, any, any computer can very easily identify it. In fact, your uh, cell phone can do it in less than a millisecond, verify that particular 
um, the piece of gold as being legit or whatever. Um, and that's what all the software does. Uh, it, uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's what every pull note software does as part of its checking that it's legit. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, uh, mining is an endeavor that requires a lot of electricity because you need a lot of electricity to, um, you know, process all of those numbers. Um, and, you know, a brute force is pretty much the only way to do it. So that, that's, um, that's how mining works. And that's a very different thing that the, uh, than Bitcoin development, which is actual coding. So, Jimmy, is it possible to have a comfortable living as a Bitcoin miner? Uh, if you happen to be very good at it, uh, I, I generally don't recommend it unless you happen to be very good at like procuring, uh, you know, mining equipment and managing, you know, procuring very cheap energy and managing a data, uh, mat, uh, mine, uh, a data facility and being able to hire the right people and so on. Uh, the only people that should really get into mining are people that have the particular skills that uh, let them be very good at mining. It's a uh, it, it's a very thin margin business uh, most of the time, in, in large part because these logistical details are not easy to uh, coordinate, and oftentimes you're going to want scale in order to uh, amortize the costs of uh, various things. If you're running one miner uh, mining machine, it's not that profitable. But if you're running ten thousand, then you, you know you you, you might be uh, onto something. Uh, but, you know, you, you have to procure like cheap energy and all that stuff. Uh, typical residential prices for energy are 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Most miners get less than three cents per kilowatt hour. So, um, you know, there aren't that many places around the world where you're going to be able to get those prices. So you, you, you have to be located in, in, in those par particular geographies. Um, so I, the, the way for... Uh, uh, that I recommend for people to earn Bitcoin is just go work, right? Like uh, whatever skills or, uh, you know, abilities that you might have, whatever goods or services that you can produce that the market wants, well, that's what you should be doing. Uh, and, uh, and once you do that, you get paid the most for those particular skills. Use that to go buy Bitcoin. And uh, this is in stark contrast to the fiat monetary system because, people do want to get into the money production business because it is enormously profitable no matter you know how many money producers there already are um, this is why for the last 50 years a lot of uh, the best and the smartest people have been going into investment banking it's not because they happen to be have such a passion for investment banking or that they are even that great at uh, the particular art of investment banking they go into it because that's where they can earn the most money and they can earn the most money because they're printing it. Every investment bank uh, has enormous amounts of leverage. And in the fiat monetary system, all money is debt. And uh, the more debt you can get into, the more the richer you can be. And that's that's how they uh, they sort of game the system for themselves. Um, and that that that's what they end up doing. Um, in Bitcoin, uh, the only people that mine are people that are really good at mining, kind of like it's kind of like asking, should I get into gold mining? Yeah, if you happen to be really good at geology and get really good construction equipment and can negotiate good leases on gold mines and so on, then sure, yeah, go for it. But should a normal person get in? Probably not, because you probably don't have those skills. Um, similar thing with Bitcoin mining. Uh, go do what you're good at, whatever uh, the bar, whatever, wherever your skills happen to land, uh, you know, like leverage that to go make money and then go buy Bitcoin with it. That's how an economy is supposed to work. So, Jimmy, is there a Russell list somewhere that lists all the Bitcoin miners in the world? Um, I mean, there, there's, uh, there, there's a lot of different facilities that do. Um, there are mining pools that you can, uh, you, you, you can know about because uh, they, they tend to advertise because it's in their interest to. Uh, but there's uh, there's literally hundreds of different Bitcoin miners, and there are even individuals that do it just uh, for fun to learn how Bitcoin works and so on. So uh, there's no universal list or centralized list at all. Um, it's a, it's a decentralized network, like I said. Is it more common to find individual Bitcoin miners work on everywhere, or like have more like more consolidated Bitcoin mining farms that work together? Yeah, usually it's consolidated mining farms because you do get tremendous, uh, you know, scale out of the uh, out of those. So, um, 
you know, if, if you have a source of energy that's like less than two cents per kilowatt hour or something like that, then you're going to want to, you know, like uh, take advantage of that and bring as my, many minor mining, uh, mining machines as possible into that facility so you can take advantage of it. Uh, yeah, individual miners don't tend to do that well because uh, electricity costs in residential areas tend to be fairly expensive compared to these other places. And also procuring the act actual equipment is not easy. You have to usually, uh, you know, uh, get on a wait list uh, with a uh, mining equipment manufacturer. And uh, from what I hear, they're sold out for like the next two years already anyway. So you're going to have to wait like two years to go get it unless you buy it after market, in which case you're paying a giant premium, in which case... Uh, your, uh, you know, days to profitability lengthen by a significant amount. So, um, you know, like generally leave it to the experts and the, the people advice. that happen to be really good at it. Because again, like I can go to my backyard with a shovel and try to dig for gold, um, but I'm probably not going to be successful and it's probably going to be a waste of my time. I would, I, I suspect that anyone that's looking to get into Bitcoin mining, it will also be a waste of their time and their uh, time and money is better spent on things that will pay them a lot more and use that to buy Bitcoin. So Jimmy, you, you had a, a statement, I think if I read it correctly, Bitcoin is changing the base level of society. What, yeah. what does that mean? Uh, so money is a base layer of civilization uh, because trade is such a big part of uh, what, what it means to be human. Uh, you know, like the reason why we don't, uh, you know, uh, sew our own clothes or grow our own food or, uh, build our own houses, at least most of us don't. I mean, there might be some homesteaders that do. Um, it is because, uh, you know, there's this division of labor that's possible through trade. So uh, somebody that's very good at growing food can, uh, you know, sell their wear, uh, uh, wares uh, into the market and not have to worry about like, um, you know, building a house or, uh, you know, educating their children or whatever. Um, that uh, and money is at the bottom layer of that. And when you have a bad money, uh, you have bad incentives that cause, uh, you know, for example, the best and the brightest in the world of the last 50 years going to investment banking instead of making spaceships that go to Mars or something. Um, uh, it, 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 it tends to cause really bad incentives. Um, and what Bitcoin does is it changes out that base layer. And once we have Bitcoin as sort of the standard, then I think what we'll see is that people go towards things that they're passionate about, that they're good at, that the market will pay for instead of, you know, wherever uh, the, this really asymmetric or this really um, unfair and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, perpetuating injustice kind of thing that uh, fiat money does and going into stuff like investment banking. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it'll be much better going forward um, uh, under a Bitcoin standard. So Jimmy, is the goal to make Bitcoin a worldwide currency? I think so. Um, I want it, uh, it, it's sound money and fiat money is not sound money. And by sound money, I mean uh, money that is that stores value well over time. Um, and uh, the, the current uh, situation is such that, you know, people, um, don't have the right incentive. So they, you know, uh, waste their time on, you know, all sorts of unproductive activities. Um, you know, they might be alcoholics or, you know, video game addicts or, you know, um, addicted to all sorts of things because, you know, their life doesn't mean anything. Um, when, when you have a good money, then you can actually like provide a good or service that the market actually wants and needs instead of, doing jobs that are completely meaningless and rent seeking uh, off of the fiat monetary system. So um, I think ultimately that's, that's, a, that's a good thing for society and that will change it in ways that, um, that I think would surprise a lot of people. So do you see this happening in our, our, our lifetime and what do you think needs to happen? Like how's, what's the process for this? Yeah, I, 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 I I think we'll see it in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, the US dollar is expanding at an unsustainable rate. And, you know, um, things that are unsustainable just sort of kind of are not sustained at some point. So um, whether that happens five years from now or 20 years from now, I don't really know. Um, there, but, you know, I, I certainly think that the expansion of the monetary supply in the United States is such that it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's in trouble uh, to some degree. And we, we haven't really seen all of the effects uh, quite yet. 
So as far as like change management, as far as Bitcoin, who do we need to convince first to make the change? Is it the bankers, the Fed, the average person on the street? Like who needs to lead a change to go to Bitcoin? What do you mean? Like, like, who, uh, like to go buy it? Yeah. Like who needs to like lead a change for like, you know, do the bankers need to switch over? To the common well, so I, I mean, I think users are switching over. I think uh, I read a statistics from Gallup. It's like 6% of U.S. investors already have Bitcoin. Um, so that per, uh, that was like 2% four years ago. So, you know, projecting that out, I mean, I guess it'll be 18% in another four years and then like 70% by in another four years. So, um, you know, I, I think at that point, uh, everybody else kind of follows. So we'll, we'll be, I think, okay. Are there any negatives with Bitcoin? Um, yeah, I, there, there are there are some negatives, and uh, these are a little more subtle. So right now, um, if you go kidnap Bill Gates, um, there's no real easy way to take advantage of that because um, you could demand like twenty billion dollars, but how are you going to get the twenty billion dollars? You have to use the fiat monetary system, and that means that they're going to know who you are as soon as you they transfer the twenty billion dollars into your account. Uh, if you try to move it in physical bills, the largest bill in the United States is the $100 bill. And $5 million in $100 bills is already like 100 pounds. So it's going to be fairly heavy to carry. Um, and if you, if you want, uh, you know, a billion dollars, that's, uh, you know, 2,000 pounds. Like that's, that's a lot of cash that's probably marked that you're not going to be able to spend very easily, uh, you know, using, uh, using that. Um, with something like Bitcoin, um, you know, uh, um, acts like that become more profitable because if you do kidnap Bill Gates, you can get demand to get paid in Bitcoin and no one will know. <laughs> like you get, uh, especially with privacy features coming in and so on, um, you know, you're, you're going to be able to say, hey, okay, or like you're, you're not. Uh, you, uh, you're you're going to have to care a little bit more about security and so on. Um, yeah, so the, those are some of them. Uh, there, there are probably other ones that I, I haven't gained out quite yet, um, but that's that's one of them. I know last year a football player for the Carolina Panthers, I can't remember his name, mm -hmm. asked for his year seller in Bitcoin, they gave him Bitcoin. So I thought, yeah, it was Russell Kuhn, he, yes, he actually yes, wrote the forward it. for my last book. Um, uh, thank God for Bitcoin, he wrote the forward for it. Uh, but yeah, he, he, he did that because he realized that Bitcoin is a much better store of value, much better savings vehicle. Uh, because as, as uh, convenient as the dollar is to go pay for everything, it does not store value over time very well. In the last year, uh, we've seen the Federal uh, Federal Reserve expand them, uh, their balance sheet from like one billion to like six billion or something, uh, one trillion to six trillion, like a tremendous amount. And it, if you look at the M2 money supply, it's gone from 15 and a half to 19 and a half or 20 trillion dollars. Um, that's a that's a significant increase. Uh, and that's how much your dollars are being diluted. This is why we're seeing inflation everywhere and so on. So um, yeah, uh, th this is why Russell uh, took his salary in Bitcoin because he knows that it's, uh, it it's going to do better going forward and, um, and that's where he wants to save his wealth. So I'm kind of making this up. Let, let's suppose uh, his salary was $10 million, $10 million a year and, he, and, he, and they got paid in Bitcoin. For the Carolina Panthers, do they pay, how does that work on the, on the, like a balance sheet? Like they like lost $10 million. Yeah. So they paid them like. Yeah. So I think uh, they, they would put the $10 million as a, uh, as wages for him. And I believe they used uh, lightning or strike as a way to convert that, those dollars straight into Bitcoin. So uh, Russell got paid in Bitcoin and uh, strike was the facilitator, but for the Carolina Panthers, it's just a, a normal, um, you know, however much my, uh, his salary was as a, a line item on their budget. And did you see more people asking him to get paid in Bitcoin? Yeah, there's already a bunch of NFL players that are doing that. And uh, from what Russell tells me, there's a lot more uh, people that are in it than you would think. Um, and, you know, they're, they're either doing something similar where they're getting their, uh, their um, teams to pay them directly in Bitcoin or they're converting it after they get paid. So either way, you know, it works for them. So since the rest of the four-year book, I'm going to presume you, you kind of know a little well. Do you happen to know what mm -hmm. got him interested in Bitcoin or how he got started on it? 
Um, I, I mean, I think it's based on, uh, you know, doing some reading and learning and so on. Um, uh, yeah, I, the one thing you have to understand about Russell is that he's an extremely smart guy, as a lot of NFL players are. If you're going to memorize like 800 page playbooks in a couple of days, you, you have to have some brain capacity. And he certainly does. Um, he, uh, he, he read, uh, up on it after, uh, becoming interested in it. And that's how he got into it as far as I know. And how did he find you? He just reached out to you or you, you know him before then? Uh, well, so, uh, he reached out to my co-author from my second book, uh, the little Bitcoin book, Alex Gladstein, and, uh, we got connected that way. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it's, it's been, um, quite an interesting uh, thing to get to know him a little bit because uh, he, he really does understand what's going on. So Jimmy, from your point of view, is Bitcoin complicated or is Bitcoin actually simple? It's, uh, it's quite complicated in the, uh, in, in the details and all of the economic stuff that you have to understand and so on. But ultimately it's simple. It's a fixed supply. And, and, then, and that means that it, as it, demand increases, the only release valve is price going up. And that's been the case for about 12 years now. So, Jamie, you're, an, you're an, advisor, change the subject a little bit. You're an advisor at a company called Unchained Capital on that level. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, I know I think in your LinkedIn profile, you talk about uh, how you say yes and no to, to startups, you're an advisor. Can you talk mm -hmm. about why you said yes to these two startups and why you often say no to the other ones? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it is a lot of work. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, for that reason, I, I have like lots of other projects that I want to be involved in. Um, these two in particular, I believe in, and that's, uh, that's why I, uh, I, uh, I'm an advisor to them. Um, I'm, I'm advisor to, you know, some other people as well, just sort of on an informal basis. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, I try to be generous with my time on, on that front, especially as, uh, you know, I see more things that are beneficial to the Bitcoin ecosystem, because ultimately it's better for my investment. Um, and that's why I do it. Uh, but yeah, I, I usually say no to startups, um, being an advisor for them, because, you know, it really is a lot of work. You, you have to, um, you know, uh, connect them with the right people and uh, you have to have them top of mind and so on. So um, I have been through that fire. I know what it's like, uh, but uh, yeah, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting older, so I don't really want to do that anymore. <laughs> so when a startup founder looks for an advisor, what should they be looking for? Uh, I mean, it depends on their needs and what their startup is about. Uh, you know, if you're like a regulatory startup, you, you might need like advisors that are really familiar with uh, dealing with regulators and so on. If you're, uh, if you need lots of money, then you want an advisor that can go give you contacts to all the VCs, uh, all the different VCs that all write checks really fast and so on. Uh, but you know, I mean, it, it, it really depends. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I tend to be a technical advisor. I, I'm familiar with the engineering part and, you know, how to put together a team and write processes and how to hire a good VP of engineering and, or something like that. Um, that, that, that I can do. Um, and that, that's what I usually bring to the table. But, you know, my skills might not necessarily be a fit for a startup that's, um, you know, I don't know, like plus size women's clothing or something like that. Like I'm, I'm going to be more or less useless to them. Uh, it really depends on your industry and what your startups are about. So Jimmy, like most of us, you have a lot going on every day. Mm -hmm. What's your method to make sure like, you know, like tomorrow that you work on things priority one through four versus priority 99 through 102, right? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I, I don't know if I've figured this out necessarily, uh, but I try to eliminate all the non-essentials. Um, so if it doesn't fit into one of the four categories that I'm about to say, then I just don't do them. So the four categories are my faith, my family, my finances, and my fitness. And if it's not one of those things, um, then I just don't waste time on it. Um, and uh, not that I, I'm like completely strict with that. I do like watch movies once in a while um, with my family or whatever. Um, but, you know, I, I try to stick with those as sort of like guiding principles for myself and uh, make sure that I uh, like whatever task I'm working on advances one of those things. So, Jimmy, speaking of fitness, how do you take care of your wellness? Uh, I, I'm really into powerlifting and I'm a carnivore um, and both have been really, really good for my health. 
Um, so I've been doing carnivory for about three years. And for those of you that know, don't know, um, I just eat meat. <laughs> I, I don't eat vegetables. I don't eat fruits. I eat meat and animal products like eggs. Um, I, I used to do cheese, although I, I do a lot less of that now. Um, and that's, uh, that's worked out really well for me. Um, you know, uh, I lost a lot of weight that I didn't think I had, uh, you know, like I, I, I'm a pretty fit person. I've been doing powerlifting for seven years. I think I, uh, at my peak, I was around 200 pounds. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I started carnivory and, um, you know, I'm down to about 180 now, um, over a few years. And, you know, it, it wasn't like I looked fat at all. It's just, you know, there, there was just excess, you know, fat that I just kind of lost. Um, uh, but yeah, power lifting is uh, very good uh, for me. Um, I, I, I think for a lot of men, it's, it, it works out really well because it does have a tendency to boost your testosterone. And it, it's very efficient in that you get to work out a lot of muscles at, at once um, instead of you know, doing isolation exercises, which are certainly a lot better for bodybuilding. Uh, but from an efficiency standpoint, I find power lifting to be a lot, uh, a lot better. Yeah, I know uh, I listen to Joe Rogan podcast some, and I think he did a carnival dive like 60 days, like last year. Mm -hmm. He talked about how you lost weight, felt better. And mm -hmm. it, it seems counterintuitive, right? Because you always like, all these people don't do plants, do no vegan, do all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But, you know, you're the second person who said that, no, actually, the carnival diet actually is like probably better. So I, I'm just like, oh, way, way better. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, it's better because uh, you know, like a lot of plants, uh, actually have things that your body is sensitive to. Um, and it, it becomes sort of like an elimination diet. Uh, a lot of the problems that people have are, are probably caused by a lot of that. Uh, they just don't know it. Um, and, uh, using it as an elimination diet is a great way to see what affects you in what way. Now, when you say meat, I'm sure you're not talking about Wendy's hamburgers or Burger King. You're talking about actually good meat, right? Like yeah, fit. most of the time. But, you know, I, I have carnivore friends that will go to McDonald's and order five beef patties and that's it. Like they don't eat any of the bread or anything. But, you know, I mean, that that's uh, certainly a lot better than vegetables uh, on a carnivore diet, just a, just the hamburger meat or whatever. Um, and, you know, it, it is better to eat like grass fed beef, um, prime beef uh, that has more animal fats and things like that. Um, but you know, like uh, meat is just like so much better than vegetables that, um, you know, that's, uh, you know, even, even a Wendy's hamburger patty is better than all of the stuff around it. And, or even like the best, most organic vegetable or whatever. Do you have a favorite meat source, like, like pork or beef or elk or something like that? Yeah, I, I'm a big, uh, beef fan, uh, and you know. Uh, I, I really like ribeyes and and things of that nature. So um, that's that's what I tend to eat. So Jimmy, back to prior to the list. So mm -hmm. how, how do you handle this? Like, suppose you have a prior to the list of like one to fifty, right? Uh -huh. and something's number thirty on the list. You never get to it, but you see it all the time. And I need to do this eventually, right? But a month goes by, two months go by, you never get to it, right? Is the time coming? Like I haven't done it in two months. I just take off the list, or do you just leave it on the list? How, how do you do those priority things? You don't never uh, well, get to. Well, it probably wasn't that important if you haven't gotten it done or if it's that low on your list. So I, I just kind of forget about it or drop it or try to get out of that obligation or something. If it is important, then you'll do it. That's, that's about it. I, I don't know. Um, it, like how you prioritize is, uh, is, is more a metaphysical question of your priorities and so on. Um, and what, what you want, want to achieve. Um, but if you're not doing it, then it's probably not a priority and therefore just you know, uh, it's probably better to drop it than to sort of let it linger and take a piece of your mind. And Jamie, it's like different entrepreneurs at different scale. Like some work, you know, 80 hour a week, some take weekends off, some take a break in the middle of the day. What do you do for your schedule? Mm, I mean, I, I just go do whatever. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I have the privilege of being able to set my own schedule. I do take naps, uh, you know, every three days or so. And I, I, and I don't, I don't care. Um, and, this is one of the nice things about not working for a corporation is that they don't, uh, I, I, I don't require butts and seats or whatever. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just do what I need to do. And, um, you know, I, I think I've developed enough discipline over the years to be able to get them done. Uh, the problem tends to be when you get distracted by something like, um, you know, if you're addicted to video games or something like that, and that's all you play for 12 hours. Yeah. You're not going to get anything done. 
um, that should be priority number 30 or, or, or whatever. Um, you know, that, uh, and like overcoming um, addiction of any kind, um, that, that's, that's not an easy thing uh, because we are inundated with all sorts of things that try to get us addicted to other things. Um, so, you know, uh, working on that is, is more an internal thing. Um, and, uh, and at least for me, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, being a Christian has helped me a lot in that regard. And, uh, and that, that's how I tend to do it. And Jamie, you're in the Austin area, correct? Yes, I am. So what's it like there now with, you know, all the so-called California transplants coming, New York City transplants coming, you know, you know, California case, you know, Austin, how's that going on? And what's the, what's the tech scene like in Austin right now, like startup scene? Is it still pretty much the same or is it changing? Uh, well, I, there's a lot more tech people coming into Austin, especially from San Francisco and New York. So um, the scene is getting, um, you know, bigger and more VCs are coming in and, and, and things like that. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, the, the city's kind of been liberal uh, for a little while. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the Californians and New Yorkers uh, and many others are causing real estate prices to go up for certain. Uh, you know, I think average days on market is like six days uh, uh, for any property right now because it's just ev everybody wants uh, to get a property here. Um, yeah, so I there there's a lot of lot of things like that happening uh, within the Austin area uh, that uh, I I don't know if they're good or they're bad, uh, but it's certainly changing. So Austin is going to be pretty much going to be home for you. Um, I mean, for the foreseeable future, I think so. Yeah. Um, and do you plan on doing any more startups in the near future, like start another company, thing like that, or? Probably not. Um, I mean, I, I, I have a nice lifestyle business that I, I'm able to do. Um, but, you know, who knows if, if there's a good opportunity that comes along. I, I, I want to spend time with my kids and, you know, be there as a father as they grow up and so on. So that that's a priority for me, at least in the, this season of life. Um, you know, like, you know, 15 years from now, when my kids are out of the house, maybe maybe things will be different. But that's where I am. So, Jimmy, is there anything I should have asked you that you want me to ask you or anything you want to talk about that we didn't cover? No, I think I think we're good. I, I actually would like to go eat lunch. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a few minutes. Um, can you share your social media links so people can reach out to you? Yeah, so it's at Jimmy Song on Twitter. Um, so uh, you can follow me there. I have a newsletter, jimmysong.substack.com. It's a Bitcoin technical newsletter that I, uh, I put out every Monday. Um, and I have some commentary on economics and things like that as well. Um, I have a podcast, Bitcoin Fixes This, which you can find on uh, your favorite podcast platform. Uh, and I have uh, a YouTube channel, Off Chain with Jimmy Song, where you can find a lot of the same content. So that's where it is. And to Alyssa, if we have the links to all the social media and everything else at our show notes, you can find the show notes at www.cavinshrblog.com. And be sure to sign up for our wait list for a better test of our platform at www.cavinshr.co. So, Jimmy, we're kind of end of our talk. Can you give us advice and wisdom or anything you want to talk about? <laughs> well, uh, you know, one, one of the th nice things about Bitcoin is that it does give you what we in Bitcoin call low time preference. Um, so the tendency in our society today is to be very high time preference, want things right now and consume things right now. And this, this is how the fiat monetary system is, done, is designed. It's designed to enslave you through debt. That lets you consume first and pay off later. Um, but that unfortunately enslaves you uh, in ways that you don't really um, understand until later. Uh, with Bitcoin, you get the opposite. It's, uh, it's about saving and then getting uh, things afterwards. Um, and that's a lot more rewarding, a lot better for character and a lot better for um, civilization, frankly. Um, so I would say uh, the, the real fruit of Bitcoin is that ability to um, think long term. And, uh, and if there's uh, w one thing that I, I would uh, encourage your listeners to um, go figure out is, uh, you know, how to think long term and how to change the incentives in your life so that you're thinking long term, because it's a lot better, a lot more rewarding, a lot more, um, a lot better for society and civilization. Jimmy, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.